Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm used to uh, saying good morning. We are about to sing, so Brad's going to come and lead us in our opening song. We're singing out of the Bethel Camp and Conference books. So you should find one nearby. Uh, we invite you to sing. Thank you for being here. It's good to see all of you. Let's sing. Thank you. If you would turn to number 19 in your songbook, Lamb of Glory, number 19. Number 19. Hear the story from God's word that kings and priests and prophets heard. There would be a sacrifice and blood would flow to pay sin's price. Precious land. Thank you. Let's turn to number one in your songbook, a great Wesleyan hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Number one. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of our God and King. The triumphs of his grace, my gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears and bids our sorrows cease. Tis music in the sinner's ear, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the phallus clean, his blood availed for me. Hear him, ye deaf, be praise ye dumb, your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold, your Savior come, and leave me late for joy. Amen. Pastor Smiley, we open our service tonight, please. Amen. Great singing tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your presence with us, and we always sense the need for you. We can't do anything good without you. I know uh, Nate feels that. We all feel that. And so we come asking, Lord, that you would come in your own special way. Come by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Jesus said when he said he would send a comforter, he called him the spirit of truth. And he would 
lead us into all truth. And so, Father, we ask that you would do that tonight, that you would come as the spirit of truth, that you would teach us and help us to be reminded of those things you've taught us and teach us things that we don't know. We, we will give you the praise and we will give you the glory. Thank you for this gathering. Thank you for everyone who serves you and, and is here for you. We pray for this conference that it will be everything you need it to be. Make us what we need to be for you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be Amen. seated. I have a card that says, in loving memory of Arthur Sly, and it goes with these flowers right here. My mother provided these flowers for our conference. Uh, Christine Sly, most of you know who my mother is. And uh, it's in loving memory of my dad. And so uh, we really appreciate her doing that. Anytime we gather as Bethel Methodists, we think about our founding general superintendent, don't we? Uh, I need to stop talking about it, though, because I need to be able to talk. So y'all help me to move on. Do we have announcements? Andrew, do you have any, sir? Please come. Our board asked Andrew to kind of shepherd conference preparation. We have a lot of great boards and committees, but uh, we asked him to kind of watch over it. Good evening. So good to see all of you. Uh, feel at home in the presence of his truth and surrounded by his family. Um, just some quick announcements, uh, and we don't want to distract from the, the worship service at all, but uh, just logistics-wise, the classroom at the base of the steps is where you'll find name tags. You'll also find your conference booklets. Uh, there's pens if you need pens, so we'd certainly uh, invite you to go register uh, to fill that out, to get a name tag. That'll be for uh, today, tomorrow. Uh, you'll also notice uh, we're just trying something. Some of you may like, uh, we, right? You remember these QR codes? Maybe you used them to look up a menu at a restaurant when you couldn't do the paper menu. Well, you can scan that QR code, and it will have the conference booklet with you. So you'll have that electronically as well as we have it in a paper form. So that choice is yours. Uh, something else that is unique, I think, from this year as opposed to four years ago, we have some poster boards. It's by the uh, General Conference banner. Uh, we would like to utilize this year those poster boards as a wall of prayer. So you can actually go, and there are markers up top. Those are permanent markers. That's why they're up high and not down low. Um, <laughs> We do invite, and if you do have little ones, we do invite little ones to go up there any prayer request. We're going to have altar prayer tomorrow morning. We're going to have altar prayer Saturday morning. We're going to have the opportunity to pray uh, as the Lord leads, uh, brings you to this altar and pray in groups, but we're also, you have the opportunity to go to that prayer wall and lift up others who have listed their prayer requests there. If you have any questions, uh, Feel free to find any of our wonderful Hill Country church family, and they'll, they'll point you in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Brad, you can come up. Uh, Brad's running back and forth tonight. I think I'll let him have my seat. Number four, Lord of Light and Wisdom. This is our first denominational song, number four, Lord of Light and Wisdom. Would you all stand, please, and we'll sing? Number four. If you would. 
would, just uh, something that I mention at camp sometimes, and I forgot to mention it earlier, if you sing an alto part or a tenor part or a bass part, please feel free to sing those parts tonight as well. The melody is great. <laughs> I love hearing all that melody. Let's take the third verse now. O Lord of all compassion. O Lord of all compassion, we praise thee for thy cross, for tasting death eternal to reconcile the lost, the Lamb of God surrender to do the Father's will with justice for have ushers. I don't know if they were aware of the fact that they're going to be in use tonight. Uh, at our general conferences, the offering goes to the local church to help defray conference expenses. So I know they appreciate your contributions to help out in that regard. I believe Sam's going to pray. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we sung tonight of the Lamb of Glory. Worthy is the lamb that was slain, worthy to receive power and glory and honor forever and ever. We praise your name tonight. We know that you are worthy. And so we bring these offerings to honor you, not just to honor you, but so that you can use them for your kingdom. We ask you, Lord, to take these offerings and use them in the place that's most needed for all of those that are a part of this kingdom, all those that are our witnesses to what's being done in this kingdom, on this earth, right now. In Jesus' name, we pray it. Gene, that was beautiful. Let's stand for the doxology, please. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father. You remain standing for one more uh, song tonight. Let's uh, turn to 193. 
He Lives, 193. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care, and though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the stormy blast. None of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, my Jesus is today. He walks with me and talks with me. A long life's arrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who see Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, but Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. God bless you all. Thank you. Please be seated. I think the choir is going to be singing for us now. If I hear a lot of people coughing, I know we did a good job. <laughs>
told Nate I'll get him back for the times he's introduced me. But no, Nate spent some uh, quality time in the Hill Country, as many of you know, and he was a ready fill-in for me so many times, and it seemed like when I was going to be uh, going and Nate was going to be preaching, they'd say, bye, have a good time. <laughs> and They didn't mind me being gone, and so I thought it was a perfect match for uh, Nate to open the conference. Uh, many of you have uh, heard me insult my sons-in-law. That's a kind of a hobby of mine. But some of you, when they're not around, have heard me say that I can't imagine having any better sons-in-law. And uh, when you have daughters, you start praying early, don't you? And it's a good idea to keep praying. You know, make, make the boyfriends think you're crazy, <laughs> which that was no problem with these two. They still think I'm crazy. But we're so thankful that Nate... Uh, even though he was super busy, I just kind of hinted that he might do this, and uh, he, he took the bait quickly and was willing, and I know he's uh, been busy with his work, his secular employment, uh, and so pray for him. I know he appreciates that, and, but we're excited to hear from Nate tonight. Amen. Thank you, Jerry. I feel like I've lately at least been pretty pretty light pretty generous with Jerry <laughs> so I always realize that he has the opportunity like tonight to come back and say some things so I have to be careful it reminds me of the first time I uh, ever went to a pastor's retreat uh, Jerry and his dad Arthur would always rib each other and I guess that was the way they told each other that they loved each other and I think it was Jerry that asked me, he said, do you and your dad do stuff like that? And I said, not like you guys. <laughs> and they just <laughs> love to cut at each other. But like I said, that's how they say I love you, I guess. But anyway, the feeling is uh, definitely mutual. I feel very blessed. And for some reason, my daughter's uh, guy friends think I'm scary. They don't think I'm crazy. They just think I'm scary for some reason. <laughs> I look at Dennis, and I'm like, now nah, I'd be scared of him. <laughs> But I, don't, I can't figure out why they're scared of me, but I'll take it. I'll take it. And I am and continue to pray for my daughters. So, Amen. It's good to be here. Uh, good to see everybody. Uh, it's a lonely place to be when uh, right here in the pulpit at this moment when you think you're doing it all by yourself. But I know that I'm not. And so we are going to ask God. I'm going to pray one more time, and we're going to ask the Lord to to meet our needs, it's so wonderful already, uh, the time of worship that we've had singing. So let's ask him to be with us in this time of the message. Father, we always can sense your presence when we are humbly asking for it. When we want to hear from you, and we want to put you in your rightful place as Lord and, and Savior and King, Father, you are always faithful. I've been reminded of that time and time again of how faithful you are. And so, Lord, we thank you for that tonight. I thank you for the ways that you have provided for each and every one of us here tonight, whether we realize it or not. Father, you have been there waiting, providing, and desiring for each and every one of us to come into a relationship with you if we have not already. And so, Lord, tonight we ask for your presence, especially during this time of the message. Lord, it is what truly has... Uh, has fed me in my years as a Christian and even before. Lord, I know that you were faithful to yourself and to your truth. And so, Lord, we continue to pray for that tonight. We thank you for this time together. It's good to be with family, and we pray now that you would be in our midst to the greatest possible degree. All this we ask in your son's name. Amen. Daniel chapter 3. Beginning with verse 10, these are going to be some uh, familiar texts to many of you, but as I did uh, tell Jerry I would be uh, more than willing to, uh, to preach the message tonight, I, I felt uh, uh, something about uh, the text this evening drawn to it, and I certainly felt the liberty and the freedom to preach from these, from these words of the Bible, so if you would turn with me there, Daniel 3 beginning with verse 10. Verse 10. 
Daniel 3.10 says, Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom among whom thou hast sent over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spoke and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do you not serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? I want to pause just a moment to tell you briefly about King Nebuchadnezzar. He had the power, and again, if you're familiar with any of this text before, Nebuchadnezzar had the power essentially to snap his fingers, take the life of any man, any woman, any person. That's the kind of power he had. That's the kind of power he abused oftentimes. Anyone he wanted, he could put to death at any time. He had that kind of authority. And you can see that when you read just this small portion of text. You can see that authoritative Boastful attitude, he approaches these three young men, and they were young men, when he asks the question in verse 15, who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? You see his attitude? You see his boastfulness? Who's going to deliver you from this? At least that's how I read it. Who can really deliver you from me? And you get the strong sense he's trying to, to intimidate them. And because he didn't believe anyone or any God, including the God of heaven whom these three men served, he didn't believe anyone could deliver them. So he said, if you don't obey me, I'm going to throw you in this fire in a moment. You think anyone can stop me? That was his attitude. That was King Nebuchadnezzar. Now I want us to keep reading in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, our God who we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, meaning if it is not the will of God to spare our lives, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and cast them into the burning fiery furnace. And pause one more moment. I know we have a lot of texts tonight, but they're all important. Notice what the king did just in summary. He was so angry. He was so furious at their response. His face changed. His temper flared up. He heated the chamber seven times more than he normally would have. And he went and got his mightiest men Indicating to me, at least to what I believe God is saying here, is there, you're not getting away from this. There's no way out. I'm so mad. I'm so furious. I'm going to turn this thing up, and you're going to be bound and put in that furnace almost instantly. He was so angry. And I want you to see his rage. There was no way they're getting out of this situation. Then in verse 21, these men, then these men, his guards, were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent, and the furnace exceeding hot, 
The flame of the fire slew, the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, uh, bound in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished, and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, we sure did. It was three of them. <laughs> he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the, to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then these three men came forth in the midst, out of the midst of the fire, and the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose bodies the fire had no power. Nothing happened to them. Nor was an hair of their head singed, neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. You think God's communicated his point here? Nothing happened. God delivered them. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel and delivered his servants that trusted in him. And I have that phrase highlighted in my notes. They trusted in him and have, not, and have rather changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own God. And that's all the text. So thank you for your patience. As I said earlier, most if not all of you have heard this portion before. And if you haven't, please hear it for the first time. It's very powerful. We, it's one of those times you could read all this and you can say, Amen, Amen, Amen. And we move on, right? But these three young men, as you can see, stood tall in the face of the secular king of the day. Nebuchadnezzar. When you think about what we just read, you can't help but think about words like resolve, courage, audacity, fearless. That's what I think about. These young men, and I love to emphasize the idea of young men. Because in today's culture, in today's society, we tend to think, oh, they're young. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. You got to let them be. These three young men trusted God, trusted in Him. And tonight, I don't want to just talk about their obvious courage, in which they certainly had, and it should be viewed as God's people, the three young men, God's people encouraging God's people. Others, us, you, me, they encourage others. They encourage me when I see what they did. I want us to see tonight how they got there. How did they get to this place? How did they get to this place in their life, in their hearts, in their minds, when it came time to really take a stand for the truth, to take a stand against the secular king of the day, Nebuchadnezzar, snap the finger, you're going in the furnace. How did they get to the place where they had that kind of resolve? This king could have taken their life in a moment. Not only did all three of them do it, but I notice also in the text, they did it together. They did it together. So I want you to think about that for a moment. They were in agreement they were in unison. They were in lockstep together in this about their willingness to not only stand up to the king, but to die. They were willing to die for the truth that they believed, for the God that they served. All for what they believed. Their Lord, their master. That encourages me. Are you willing to die for your master? The question is, how did they get there? This place of resolve, 
I think it is worthy of our examination and of our consideration tonight. We are gathered together at this conference, Bethel Methodist. I've been a part of this church for, well, Jennifer and I have been 18 years. I'm watching my girls grow up. I'm watching Olivia grow up in my church and all these others. 18 years? I've been a part of this church just a little before that. And we're gathered together and y'all encourage me. Because God is at the center of what we do. So how did they get there? Lord, give me this kind of faith and resolve that says when I stand in the place of adversity, persecution, or even death, Lord, I am willing. I'm willing. So in thinking about these three young men, I think this text is so amazing because we see No indication from God in his revelation. Correct me if I'm wrong later. (laughs) But I see no indication from God that any of these men hesitated in what they did. They didn't hesitate. Nebuchadnezzar says, hey, are you going to bow down and worship? Because if you don't, I'm going to throw you in this fire. You're not going to like it. And without a doubt, they did not hesitate. I want you to look back at Daniel 3, 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true? Remember the, the guards came and said, O king, there's these guys over here. They're not worshiping. The golden image. So he calls them in his midst and he says, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do you not serve my gods nor worship the golden image which I have set up. It's almost as if Nebuchadnezzar was willing to give them a break when he found out about their transgression. Is it true? Did you really do this? I believe you violated this law, but is it really true? Maybe it was just a mistake. Maybe you didn't know the law. Maybe you weren't quite sure about what to do here. I think he goes forward and he gives them the law all over again. If you hear that music, you fall down and worship the golden image I set up. And if you will do that, we're all good here. But don't you know if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. I will kill you. I will cast you into that human oven and I will burn you up. Now, who in their right mind would ever sign up for anything like that? The point is that Nebuchadnezzar made absolutely certain they understood the rules. They understood what was going on. Guys, these are your only two options with me. This is all you have. You better make a decision. So the king made it crystal clear first. And then what he said next is the part that really speaks, I believe, to the heart of these men. Guys, these are your only two options. You can bow or you can die, and if you choose the latter, he asks them the question again. I want to read it to you one more time. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? If you choose the latter, who do you think is going to deliver you? If you do not obey me, if you do not bow down to my law, if you do not worship my God, My image instead of your God. Don't you know you're going to pay severe consequences? He had to know that they were crystal clear in what they were doing. And it was presented before them. And they knew what they were doing. And without any hesitation, they said, yes, we know what we're doing. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Let me ask you, God's people. Do you know who that God is? that Nebuchadnezzar was talking about? (laughs) Who is that God that will deliver you? Do you know that God? That delivers? It is the God that these three men served. Worshipped, honored with their lips and their lives. In other words, it wasn't just lip service. Don't just say in your mind, yeah, of course, I know that God. I know who he's talking about. Don't say that. Do you really know this God who they served? Not just in words, but with their life. 
Truly, God is asking us tonight, do you know this God that is able to deliver? Do you know that in the face of adversity, pain, agony, or even certain death, there is a God that delivers His people? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew Him. The God that they served, they really knew Him. They served Him. They worshipped Him. Again, it is their lack of hesitation that speaks so much to me about the heart of their testimony. There was no hesitation about what they said. They were in unison together in their response to this evil king, and it is their resolve, their faith, and their courage in the Lord together that brings me such comfort in looking at a situation where literally there was no way out. No way out. Physically speaking, and I confess to all of you tonight, I'd, I have not sit in the presence of an, eagle, of an evil king threatening to throw me into a fiery furnace, especially one that he heats up seven times and gets these big guys about as big as Dennis, you know, <laughs> throwing me into the fire. I don't know that I'd want to want to fight unless I was fighting for my life. But there was no way out. I've never stood in that kind of situation. But let me tell you what I do know. I sense the weight and the pressure of sin threatening the spiritual lives of those who will stand up to evil. I want you to hear that again. I sense the weight and the pressure of sin threatening the spiritual lives of those who will truly stand against evil. I think you sense it amongst each other. You know the reality of sin. You live in this world. You see what it does to your families, to your children. All around you there is sin and temptation saying exactly what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. Hey, if you don't do this my way, don't you know you're going to die? But if you'll go the way of the world, everything will be better. Everything will be easier. Everything will be hunky-dory. Don't you think it would have been easier for those guys? Okay, fine. I'll, I'll worship the golden image. Nope. They stood in the face of evil. They stood for truth. Satan tries to make all of this attractive. Everything. When I say this, I mean everything out there. Attractive. Pretty, sounds good, looks good. Don't serve your God, serve me, serve another God. Do what everyone else is doing. Isn't that the message of the world? Serve yourself. Look at what you don't have. Look how easy you could make things if you would just comply, if you would just go along, if you would just go worship this golden image. Everything would be fine. I wouldn't have to threaten you with going into the fire. Who wants that? Just worship the golden image already. It's true, God's people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have complied. They could have made it easy. But I also believe that on the inside where it really mattered, they would have died. They would have died. They would die on the inside because that means they counted their own lives precious and worthy of life before their relationship with the God that they served. If they would choose to die and show courage under the threat of that fire, they would really be choosing life. And don't you know that's exactly what they did? They chose to live. They didn't choose to die, they chose to live. And I want you to see that the choice was not really physical life or death. It was spiritual life or death. That is what they knew. That is what they believed. That's what gave them to courage to stand before this evil king. It's what they believed. And that's why they were all together. That's why they were not afraid and ready to give their life. Because they knew that they had, they had him. Isn't that all that matters? God's people, isn't that all that matters? 
when you know that you have Him, if you have nothing else, if you stand before an evil king, if you stand under the threat of anything else in this world, you have Him. That's all that matters. So that's where they were, and that is exactly where God needs you and me and all men to be. That's what we pray for. I am not afraid to stand up to evil and wrong and things that are false. It may cost me everything, but at least I will have everything that matters. And when you understand this, I ask you, what what else do you need to know? (laughs) Really? My church in North Texas, they get so sick and tired of me probably. Nobody's, nobody's been mean enough to tell me yet, but they get so tired. Isn't this simple? What else do you need to know? If you have him, you don't need anything else. So I want you to listen how they responded to Nebuchadnezzar's question. Because this is the part that I just really get excited about. The question at the end of verse 15 said, Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? And I want you to hear their response in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. And yeah, and I know some of you, if if you're like me and you have a King James Bible, you're thinking to yourself, okay, what exactly? Let me give you another translation to help us out a little bit. They said, it is not really necessary for us to answer you on this. Is it? Is this really necessary? (laughs) Who's going to deliver you from my hand? Is this really necessary that I answer this? Okay, but I will. And I know if, if I'm interpreting that wrong, I know they didn't mean it disrespectfully because that's not the character of these young men but I almost want to laugh at their response. The king says, if you will fall down and worship me, we're good, but if you don't, I'm going to kill you in this furnace. You're going to suffer an instant death, slow, uh, not instant rather, but slow and agonizing. You're going to burn up. Who's going to deliver you from me? And when the scripture says they were not careful to answer him, they didn't even think about how to respond because they knew who they served. They knew what they were going to say. They were ready. As I told you earlier, no hesitation. They didn't hesitate. So I say, I want to laugh. It's it's almost in my mind, you're joking, right, this king? But that that was their confidence in their God. Who will deliver us? Is that the question? Who will deliver us? The God in which we serve, of course. He will deliver us. The God of heaven and earth, the God of all eternity, the God that obviously you do not know, He will deliver us. But listen, this is important that we understand a part of this message and what we're saying in this particular portion of text. When these three young men made the statement in their response to the king, they didn't answer him by saying, just throw us in the fire, we'll show you. That's not what they said. Throw us in the fire. God will show you a miracle. They didn't say that either. Put us in there, I dare you, and watch how God will deliver us. I dare you. That wasn't their response. (laughs) They did not do this. They did not respond to him in this way. Our lives will be justified by God sparing our lives. Rather, what they said was this. Whatever, listen, whatever is the will of God, so be it. What is your will, Lord? So be it. In verses 17 and 18, they say, look, if God wants to spare our lives from this, He's able. He can do it. When we pray for each other, physical illness, physical pain, we say, Lord, your will be done. And if you will spare our friend, our family, our spouse, if you will spare their life, Lord, if it's your will, so be it. But if it's not, so be it. Thank you. So be it, Lord. Your will be done. 
When we examine Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it's easy to look at them and notice, rightfully so, of their courage, their resolve, and their perseverance. They are a great testimony to me, and I hope they are to you too. And I thank God for them. But Satan desires to lure you, lure you, simply into the worship of, quote, other gods or worshiping or away from worshiping the one true God. That is his only goal. That is his only desire. He wants you to count your life dear unto yourself. And if Satan can accomplish that, I want you to know he is winning. But the part of this story that needs to be elaborated, at least as God has led me tonight, is by examining and emphasizing the fact that these men were willing to lose their life for their faith. Them living another day was not the most precious thing to them. Compromising in order to not face the judgment of that fire was not even an option. That's why they didn't hesitate. That's why my loose interpretation, my loose understanding is, are you kidding? Who is the God that's going to deliver us? Are you kidding? That's why there was no hesitation. Because they did not fear the judgment of the furnace. It wasn't even an option. So our question tonight as we are gathering for this conference, I'm so excited to be here, by the way. See my Hill Country family I haven't seen in a long time. Jerry alluded to the fact that I'm busy a little bit. But I love doing nothing more than what I'm doing right now. Our question tonight is do we have this kind of resolve for God? Do we have this kind of regard? Uh, Resolve for our Lord. Nate, you're going to lose your life if you don't do this. You think Satan doesn't try that message on me? <laughs> you think I'm naive enough to think he doesn't try it on you? You're going to lose your life if you don't do this. If you don't give in to the culture, if you don't do what the rest of them are doing, you're going to pay dearly. Guys, if you don't start compromising in some ways, you're going to fail. God's people don't do it. We all face this. Sin is everywhere. Temptation is everywhere. It may not be physical life or death, but it may very well certainly be spiritual life or death. And that's what we have to remember. And that's how these three young men have encouraged me tonight. And as I prepared for this message, God help us to have the kind of courage Every day that says, no matter what Satan tries to tempt me with, no matter if I have to make a decision that may cost me my life, I will choose you. That is what I will choose. Every time, 100%, every time. Bethel Methodist, fellow Christians, those who I'm looking at tonight, some of you I don't think I've met before, and I look forward to doing that. Fellow Christians, the condition of the church and therefore the world is not getting better morally. I'm not saying there is zero good out there. Don't get me wrong. There are faithful people. There is good. But it's not getting better. Satan and sin is abounding. The, the will of many to love and serve Jesus Christ as these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, willing to stand in the face of evil. It is fading. God's people do not fade in the truth. Do not fade in what you know God needs you to do. And that is to stand and continue to show courage under fire. If you've got a bulletin tonight, you see that's the title of the message. Courage under fire. <laughs> I want to encourage all of you in the same way they encouraged me. By saying, if you will stand with God, no matter what it costs you, you'll never regret it. 
ever. I say that with such confidence, even more than you sitting here in front of my face. I say that with such confidence. Not arrogance, confidence. You will never regret serving and putting him in his rightful place. So I want to encourage you tonight in that regard. And I was just telling someone yesterday. I was having, no, two days ago. I don't remember when it was. (laughs) My days kind of run together sometimes. I was just telling someone the other day, let's call it that. We have an amazing privilege and responsibility to call ourselves Christians. What an amazing responsibility. I think the person was like, I hadn't really thought of it that way, but maybe it's because I was so passionate about it. I tend to get a little passionate. But what an amazing responsibility we have. You go out into this world every day and you call yourself a Christian. You serve a mighty God who is able to give you the grace to stand in front of an evil king even when your life is threatened and say, I'm not serving you. I'm not doing that. That encourages me. It should encourage our young people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't that old. They were in the culture. They saw what was going on. So do all of us. But let that encourage you tonight. Will you stand with God, not just in words, but in action, meaning with your life? Stand with God. When you say you love Him, mean it. I love you, Lord. I give my life to you. No matter what it costs me, I give my life to you. I just, uh, I'm done. I'm looking at my notes and I'm like, no, nope, Lord's saying no. But I want you all to know, I love you. I love you so much. I'm so thrilled to be able to be here tonight standing with you because I know Jerry, our general superintendent. I know Friedman. I know Sam. I know John Dave. I know others, not just the ministers, but all of you that I stand with and love so much tonight. I am standing here with you, encouraging. I pray God is encouraging you. And that's what we need. I've realized that probably more. I don't know. Am I getting older? Is it because I'm a dad? Lord, I need you. That realization has hit me like a ton of bricks. Constantly, I need you, Lord. And we need each other. We need each other. Serve God, no matter what it costs you. Amen. Let's sing an invitation. I believe it's I Surrender All, right? What number is that? 131.
when you think when you think about this hymn and what it's saying, maybe it takes some of you back like it does me about the time I surrendered everything. And I'm sorry to say I was older than I should have been when I surrendered everything. That's a regret I have. But God has forgiven me and I don't dwell on it. So don't misunderstand. But I'm thankful that I had men and people who loved me enough when I was not living for God that said, this is it. This is the way. And I'm so thankful that I was taught the truth that said, hey, if you're going to come, you better stay. If you're going to come, you better stay. And so God worked and He worked and He worked. And finally, I said, yes, Lord. And I'm, that is no regret. If you have never surrendered at all, not a part, but all, if you have never given it all, do it. Do it. Don't listen to me. Listen to Him. Do it. You'll never regret it. It's the best decision you can ever make. And get, then guess what? Then you get to keep living every day as God has you here. And then you get to keep making that decision. I'm still surrendering everything. It's so wonderful. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Let's sing the last verse. All to Jesus I surrender. Lord, I give myself to Fill me with thy love and power, let thy blessing fall on me. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. Let's pray. Father, I'm reminded time and time again of how faithful you are. You were faithful to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in a very, very difficult moment in their life. And Father, I love the way that you have revealed what transpired in this occasion because, Father, it has given us opportunity to be encouraged. But most importantly, Father, it has given us opportunity to see who you are. That you are the God that is able to deliver. Maybe not from a fiery furnace. But from the bondage of sin. To know that there is spiritual life and eternal life. Father, if we will say yes to you. And stand in the face of evil. Lord, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for the ways that you communicate your truth so wonderfully and powerfully as only you can. Only by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit are you able to speak to our hearts tonight and every day. So Lord, we thank you for this conference. We thank you for the Bethel Methodist Church of the Hill Country. We know how tiresome preparing for conference can be. And yet, Father, we know that these people serve not for themselves, but for you. And I thank you for that. We are all grateful, Lord, but we are most grateful for you. And so we ask, Father, that you would be in this, in this conference in every way, that you would lead us, direct us, and help us to stand strong and firm in this world that you have placed us in. Father, so that you might be glorified. Through our light, through our lives, Father, you would be glorified. Others would see you and come to know you, Father. So, Lord, go with us in this time of fellowship. Thank you for your people. Thank you for our visitors. Lord, and thank you for yourself. We love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen. Amen. God bless you.